uh, who will introduce our panel and our moderator. Um, Tom is an alum of Auburn University and the first African American athlete to graduate from Auburn University. He's an actor, an author, and also honorary co-chair of our commemoration committee. Um, and as many of you know, we have been working um, to organize these events over the last two semesters. Um, if you have not taken the opportunity to pick up one of the handouts and programs or commemorative calendars at the desk outside the door there, please feel free to do so because it does list other events that will be uh, continuing throughout the semester. Again, I thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy the forum. We have uh, some housekeeping um, information that Bill will share with you shortly. Tom? to a tape that I have of Dr. King's speeches. I listen to I Have a Dream, The Drum Major Instinct, and I See the Promised Land. And there were several words that continued to occur throughout his speeches. Those words were courage, uplift, love, forgiveness, freedom, leadership, nonviolence, discipline, and the phrase great and noble. <coughs> As I think about the men sitting here on our panel, I realize that these words can be also used to describe these men. Men who made a difference in our world. If you are an Auburn person, if you live in the state of Alabama, if you were educated in the state of Alabama, these men helped to make that possible. And so I'd like to introduce them to you, and you have their bios in front of you, and so I'm only going to hit the highlights. And I'm not going to go in order in which they're seated, I'm going to go in the order of which you guys gave me the information. <laughs> I'd like to start with Judge U.W. Clement. And Judge Clement, since we're not going in order, would you raise your hand for those who may not know you? I've been knowing and knowing of Judge Clement for a long time. He's one of my heroes. After nearly 30 years on the federal bench, Judge Clement, the former Chief Justice of the United States District Court of the Northern District, retired and returned to law practice in 2009. He was educated in the segregated public schools of Jefferson County, and at the age of 13, he decided that he wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. His early involvement in the 62 boycott of Birmingham's downtown stores and his fight to end the segregation of the Birmingham Public Library earned him the designation of one of Dr. Martin Luther King's foot soldiers in the Birmingham Civil Rights Movement. In 1974, he became one of the first two blacks to be elected to the Alabama State Senate since Reconstruction. President Jimmy Carter appointed Clement as Alabama's first black federal judge in 1980. He served as chief judge of the court from 1999 to 2006. Judge E. W. Clement. Mr. Harold A. Franklin. On January 3rd, 1964, Mr. Franklin became the first African American student to enroll at Auburn University. And although there were obstacles to Mr. Franklin getting his degree here, he paved that way 
for many of us in this room, and for me. He went on to earn a master's degree in history at the University of Denver, and later he pursued a renowned career in higher education at many institutions, Alabama State University, North Carolina A&T, Tuskegee Institute, Talladega College, retiring in 1992. And in 2001, 37 years after leaving the university, he was awarded an honorary doctor of arts from Auburn University. He's currently a resident of Sylacauga, Alabama, Mr. Harold A. Franklin. Mr. Fred Gray, a man I've known of probably most of my adult life, is a prominent Alabama civil rights attorney whose clients have included Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and the victims of the Tuskegee syphilis study. When he opened his Montgomery Law Office in 1954, he was one of the few African-American attorneys in the state of Alabama. He played a pivotal role in dismantling legal segregation in our state. He was also the plaintiff's attorney in Franklin versus Auburn, which desegregated Auburn University. On January 28, 1963, Mr. Gray filed the Lee versus Macon County Board of Education, and as a result of this case, the court issued an order in 1967 that integrated all of Alabama's educational institutions that were not already under court orders. Lawsuits filed by Mr. Gray eventually desegregated all public colleges and universities in the state, as well as more than 100 local school systems. As of 2007, Mr. Gray serves as president of the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center, a nonprofit corporation for the purpose of housing a permanent memorial on behalf of the participants in the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. If you're not aware of the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, I suggest that you uh, look it up. Uh, it's probably one of the sadder times in the history of our country. Mr. Anthony Lee graduated from Macon County High in Notosova, Alabama in May of 1964. He was one of the first two African-American undergraduates to enroll at Auburn University. He was the first African-American student to complete four years at Auburn University and graduate. He graduated in May 1968. Mr. Lee subsequently was hired as one of the first black state parole and probation officers in Alabama in September of 1973. In 1983, he relocated to Southern California, where he worked as a trade show installer for local Union 831 and was eventually promoted to union steward. He was also elected to serve as a union officer. He retired in May 2006 and relocated to Tuskegee, where he enjoys his retirement and lives with the goal of helping to eliminate poverty for the residents of Tuskegee. Mr. Anthony Lee. <laughs> Mr. Samuel Pettijohn received a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Auburn University in 1967 and a Master's of Engineering Science and Computer Science from Loyola College in 1987. He has served in various capacities at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for 25 years. He has a solid background in event analysis related to accidents and incidents involving the commercial and industrial uses of nuclear material, including the nuclear fuel cycle. His expertise includes database design and coding of events related to the use of nuclear materials. Mr. Samuel Pettinger. <laughs> Mr. Willie Wyatt, Jr. grew up in Tuskegee, Alabama. In 1957, where he completed his elementary school education at Washington Public School. He began his high school education at Tuskegee Institute High School. During the summer of 1963, while the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led hundreds of thousands of people in the march on Washington to bring about his dream of races together without fear of reprisals, Willie quietly joined the legal action entitled Lee versus the Macon County Board of Education, 
with the goal of forcing desegregation in the public schools of Macon County and Tuskegee and end the travesty of separate but equal school accommodations. After continued resistance and additional legal wrangling, the school mysteriously burned down. <laughs> Willie was one of three seniors who received his diploma in May of 1964, but unfortunately not with the pomp and circumstance one would usually expect from a graduation. The schoolmates were handed their diplomas from a Macon County high school administrator and were advised to consider this your last day due to the fear school administrators had of negative repercussions. After graduation, Willie enrolled in Auburn University and later transferred to Tuskegee Institute where he earned a BS degree in electronic technology. Mr. Willie White. Our moderator for today will be Mr. Bill Leftwich. Bill is a principal with the LS Strategic Group, which is based in Chicago, Illinois. The LS Strategic Group focuses on business development and issues of equal opportunity, diversity, and race and inclusion. Mr. Leftwich provides services to clients in both the public and private sectors across the United States, Europe, China, and South Africa. He is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Equal Opportunity. He directed the development and coordination of equal opportunity policies affecting virtually all civilian employees and military personnel within the Department of Defense worldwide. He also exercised program oversight over the three military departments and 14 defense agencies as they implemented Department of Defense agency-wide equal opportunity policies. He's received two letters of recognition from President Bill Clinton. Uh, he received two letters of appreciation from Secretary of Defense William Cohen for excellent leadership and for issues regarding the President's initiative on race. He's also the recipient of the Dr. Benjamin L. Hooks Distinguished Service Award from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Mr. Bill Leftwich. That's our panel and our moderator. I'd like to call Mr. Leftwich to the podium. so seldom received and so richly deserved. <laughs> good morning, good morning to all of you. I'm certainly pleased to be here. And I would like to welcome you to what should be an informative <coughs> and interesting Auburn University commemorating 50 year of integration program. I'd like to add a special thanks to President Jay Gouge and to Dr. Paulette Dilworth for her vision of planning a year-long retrospective on this important issue. Now, we should all know that this journey has been one that has involved not only black folks, but white folks, men, women, persons with disabilities, and other groups. But what we will get today is really a cross-section of those groups and those efforts, these are key individuals to the evolution of where we are today, not only in our country, but in Alabama and certainly at Auburn University. If you would allow me to start our journey, let me take you back to 1964, where gasoline was 30 cents a gallon. Mm. President Johnson declared a war on poverty. Luther Terry, the, the Surgeon General, made a statement that smoking may be hazardous to your health. The Beatles arrived in February of 1964 for their first visit to the United States. And as they arrived, we were all listening to the Motown sounds of the Temptations singing My Girl. <coughs> The first Mustang rolled off of the assembly line of the Ford Motor Company. IBM announced a, a platform of the System 360, which was the first family of compatible machines, and computers entered the general world of business. On June 21st, 
three civil rights workers, Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, are murdered in near Philadelphia, Mississippi. They were murdered by local segregationist law enforcement officials. On August 4th, their bodies were found in Mississippi. In July of 64, 5,000 additional American military troops were sent to South Vietnam. That raised our military presence there to a number of 21,000. Also in 1964, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. There was also one other song that ties directly to what we're going to deal with today. And Sam Cooke recorded it, and we all listened to it in 1964. It's called The Change Is Gonna Come, which brought about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Let me give you just a very brief history, and then we'll move quickly to our panel. The Civil Rights Act of 64 is our nation's benchmark of civil rights, and it continues to resonate in America today. The Civil Rights Act of 64 prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Passage of the act ended the application of Jim Crowism, which had been upheld by the Supreme Court in its 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson, in which the court held that racial segregation purported to be separate but equal was constitutional. The Civil Rights Act was eventually expanded by Congress to strengthen the enforcement of these fundamental civil rights. The House Judiciary Committee held a series of hearings on the proposed legislation during the summer of 1963. The proposed bill was amended during that process in those committees to broaden the scope of the protections. The changes strengthened President Kennedy's original proposal in response to a tumultuous summer in 1963 which saw several incidents of racially motivated violence across the South. The House Judiciary Committee approved the legislation on October the 26th of 63 and formally reported it to the full House on November 20th, 1963. That's just two days before President Kennedy was assassinated. On November 27th of 63, President Johnson asserted his commitment to President Kennedy's legislative agenda, that is, particularly that of the civil rights legislation. The House of Representatives passed the final version of the Civil Rights Act on February the 10th of 64. The bill came before the Senate in February of 64. There was a great deal of consternation, political moving, maneuvering, but the Senate began debate on the proposal on March 30th of 64. Senator Ed Kennedy, a uh, member of the Senate Judicial Committee, dedicated his first speech on the floor of the United States Senate in consideration of the Civil Rights Act. After a 54-day filibuster of the legislation, a bipartisan group of senators introduced a compromise bill the legislation enjoyed Senate support to end the stalemate and was ultimately passed on June 19th of 64 by a vote of 73 to 27. On July 2nd, 64, the House voted to adopt the Senate passed legislation rather than insisting on a conference of the bill. President Johnson signed the bill into law that very day. The Civil Rights Act paved the way for future anti-discrimination legislation, including the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So as part of our program, I am posing an overall, overarching question to all of our panelists, 
And what has been the impact of the 1964 Rights Act on Alabama, Auburn University, and to themselves? One small note, after our panel finishes, we are going to allow you to come to this mic, which is located on my left, your right, and ask a very brief question with emphasis on well, brief, no speeches. So having said that, let me bring our first panelists either to the podium or to the seat, whichever is most appropriate. The Honorable Judge, you, Doug. Thank you, uh, Mr. Leverage, uh, my brothers and sisters. It's a great joy to be here this morning, and particularly to be in the presence of uh, one who I think is the most important civil rights lawyer uh, in the history of the state. He would say, that perhaps Arthur Shores, who inspired him and who did a whole lot. But uh, Fred Gray, for uh, over 60 years, has been in the forefront, the leadership of the civil rights movement from a lawyer's point of view. And I stand in awe of him. In terms of the 64 Civil Rights Act, I take some special pride in it. I was a student at Miles College in Birmingham in 1962. And as part of the overall uh, determination of black students in the southern states to do something about the uh, gross injustices flowing from the separate but equal doctrine. Our student body led a boycott of downtown stores. Don't shop the stores that offend the dignity, we said. And that boycott got national attention, including that of Martin King. And so he came to Birmingham in the fall of 62 and decided uh, to commence the massive attack in the ensuing spring of 63. That uh, Birmingham movement led to the March on Washington and to the enactment of the 64 Civil Rights Act. 63 was a very important year uh, for a lot of reasons. We had the demonstrations. Uh, we had in, in uh, August of 63, my good friend, Harold Franklin, applied to Auburn University. And then in uh, September, we had the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church and the killing of four little girls and, and two uh, young black men. And then in um, October, I believe it was November of 1963, Judge Frank Johnson uh, said that Fred Gray was right and ordered the desegregation of Auburn University, all in 1963, which led to the 64th <coughs> entrance of uh, Mr. Franklin as Auburn's first black student. And you know, it's really very interesting because the idea of, of desegregating 
graduate schools had long been settled. It was settled before the 1954 decision in the, in the Brown case. Uh, in 1948, in the uh, Sweat v. Painter case, uh, all, in, all other states, except perhaps uh, two or three here in the deep south, Alabama included, really we had no issue in terms of desegregating the graduate schools. And that's what, that's what Harold was all about, going to graduate school. Now, there was a, a, a uh, phenomenon that ought to be mentioned. You know, they used to keep blacks out of Auburn and Alabama by paying them to go out of state to get an education, and it was a, good, a great job. Because how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they see Paris? <laughs> so when I, I went to, uh, couldn't go to Alabama Law School, I went to Columbia and one of the, well, was one of the few, uh, like Fred, <laughs> who came back. Uh, but we don't think that we lost any things in terms of a quality of education uh, because of, of, that, of, of that journey. Let, let me just kind of close by saying this. It's important for us to remember what happened at Auburn in, uh, in 1964, what happened at Alabama in 1969 when I filed a lawsuit against Bear Brown, principally because a year, a year earlier, Chuck Jordan had uh, placed a black on the Auburn football team, and the folks in Alabama were jealous. <laughs> it was, uh, it's important to remember the uh, United States and, and uh, Knight versus Alabama, the desegregation case, uh, which I was a judge for a short period of time. And it's important to remember all of those things because as we stand here now, situations for black, the situation for black folks in this country at the Supreme Court level is worse than it's ever been since the Civil War. So with the election of Barack Obama, racism became predominant again. And we have a Supreme Court that is actually more hostile to us than any court since the Dred Scott decision. I'm going to yield the rest of my time to Dred. <laughs> Judge Clement, thank you for your remarks. And next to our uh, speaker's uh, microphone will be attorney Fred Gray. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And thank you, Judge Clemens, my friend. Let me first acknowledge my wife here, Carol and also Judge Clemens' wife, <laughs> Judge Clemens, uh, the two of us were nominated by President Carter to become federal judges. I was nominated for the Middle District, the seat that Frank Johnson had at uh, UW for the one in the Northern District. Initially, it looked like I was going to make it, and Judge Clement was not going to make it. But what uh, Senator Heflin didn't realize is that his supporters in Alabama put so much pressure on him uh, until he, in effect, said, I know we are committed to recommend two blacks for judgeships in Alabama. But Fred Gray has filed more lawsuits to desegregate the state than anybody else, so get somebody else other than him. I withdrew, but I only withdrew after I had recommended Judge Myron Thompson, who became the judge and who now has just taken senior status, and he has made a great judge along with Judge Plummer. Let's give both of them a hand. I cannot do justice to this subject in seven minutes, but I hope 
obey what I'm told, and when seven minutes come, I'll just stop. <laughs> but I do want you to know that normally I would not be in Alabama ever since Dr. King's birthday. I was, and I was the one who ended up filing one of the first bills in the legislature of Alabama in 1973 in order for it to become his birthday when I was one of two blacks to serve in the Alabama legislature since Reconstruction. My bill never got out of committee, but it set the precedent for others that did get out of the committee. But when I was called, uh, written by uh, our moderator, Dr. When uh, she called me and asked Dr. Dilworth about coming, I refused to accept invitations to institutions all over the country who would have given substantial contributions to the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center in order to be here with you today. I felt it was important enough to be with Harold Franklin, one of my clients, and why, and Lee, who were also my clients. <laughs> and Mr. Kent, John, you can know, he was a part of the class. So all of these persons up here who were plaintiffs in lawsuits and who have finished this university, I represented them. Right. And I'm glad, and let's give them a hand. <laughs> person who always wanted to be a lawyer. When I was growing up in the 40s in Montgomery, that was basically two professions that African American young men will be well respected, and I think you know what they are, a preacher and a teacher. And I decided I was going to be both. <laughs> I was sent off to our church school up in Nashville, came back, living on the east, on the west side of Montgomery. I enrolled at Alabama State College for Negroes. Had to use the public transportation system. And I saw how our people were being treated on the buses. This is in the 40s. I also recognized that everything in Montgomery was completely segregated and that a person of color, I don't care how meritorious his case may have been against a white person, there was very little likelihood of getting any justice. I made a secret commitment, and the best part about it, I kept it secret for about 40 years, and that is I was going to finish law school. I was going to finish college at Alabama State, go to somebody's law school using the funds that Jess Clemens had told you about, and I did, and went to Case Western Reserve University. I was going to come back to Alabama, pass the bar exam and destroy everything segregated I could find. That was the mm -hmm. commitment that I made when I was a upper teenager. In May of 51, I finished straight. In September of 51, I enrolled in case in Western Reserve University in Cleveland. In three years, in June of 51, 54, I finished Western Reserve took the Ohio bar exam just in case in June, <laughs> the Alabama bar exam in July, was told in August I passed both, and on the 8th of September, 1954, I opened my law office and I'm now ready to start destroying everything segregated I could find. <laughs> if I live until September 7th, I will have been practicing law in this state for 60 years. <laughs> and I can tell you that the cases we are filing now are much more difficult than they were 50 years ago. We just lost a case, and all of you know about Victory Land right next door. How can you justify being able, when we had a constitutional amendment that the people passed, voted on it, 78%, it operated for four years, brought millions of dollars into the governmental entities, including the state of Alabama, employed over 2,000 people, 
and now at that charter exit it lays waste. And now they say, and a court has ruled, that there wasn't a denial of any voting rights. That case is going to be appealed, probably be appealed today. I might end up getting sanctioned because they've already entered a sanction against the lawyer who filed it. But I feel that we are now at a point where it is so important and people don't realize the problems we still have. And while you have opened the doors here at Auburn, and you didn't do it voluntarily, Alabama has never on any of these cases voluntarily decided to desegregate anything, notwithstanding what the Supreme Court may have ruled in the Shelby County case. But, and I was supposed to tell you about the effect of the Voting Rights Act. But let me tell you my role in that. <laughs> After they were beaten back on Bloody Sunday, they called me, and I left Montgomery, very in Montgomery at the time. Came across Betty's Bridge, talked to the plaintiffs involved, including now Congressman Lewis and Mrs. Borrington and others. They retained me to represent them, and before the close of day on Monday, we filed a case of Jose Williams versus George Wallace, which resulted in an order being entered to protect the persons as they marched to Montgomery, which gave the news media and the impetus to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. I'm going to tell you, one, racism in this state is still alive. And if this university lives up to its creed, it needs to make a thorough investigation of itself and see really where you are. Because as long as you think you have arrived, you'll never make it, and you'll never solve the problem. But you still have race problems right here. You're not the only one. This whole state has a problem. And now everybody thinks it's over. Secondly, it's not going to go away by itself. If these people had not retained me or some other lawyer to file a lawsuit, it never would have been integrated. I don't know what would have happened. So then, it's not going to go away by itself. It's going to take a plan. The Montgomery bus boycott didn't start by itself, and most of you don't know how, but I can tell you how you can find out in a minute and not be through. <laughs> and that is, if you're going to solve the problem, you're going to have to come up with a plan. And the third thing you're going to have to do, a plan is no good if you don't implement it. And if you wait on somebody else to solve the problem, it'll never be solved. My challenge to this university and to all of you is realize that racism is a problem. You've got to come up with a plan to implement it, uh, to have a plan to do away with it, and then you have to implement it. And last, let me give a compliment to Auburn University. Uh, they talked about the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center. And I want you to know that I believe it was Dr. Wilson and some other persons of this university who has an outreach program. They have really helped us to have one of the best small museums in this in the country. When you get a chance, come down to Tuskegee to see it. I have a few brochures on it. And uh, we believe that you'll see the contributions made. And it, it's for, really, it has three missions. One, to show the contributions made by the people who occupied the land, Native Americans, Americans of European descent, and Americans of African descent. Second, it's a memorial to the men in the infamous Tuskegee Sisters study. And last, it shows the role that Macon County has played in the Civil Rights Movement. Because most people don't know, but the first voting rights cases in Alabama started in the early 40s in Macon County, Alabama with Dr. Domian and William P. Mitchell. Now, if you want the whole story about the Civil Rights Movement, 
that one please, you can sign all of it. I send bus ride to justice, and I'm too. Thank you very much. Said, yeah. So he said, he said, you don't have a gun. And I said something crazy like, 
I'm not going to hunt I'm going to school. And, uh, she said, I'm not going to let anything get me down. That's, that's one thing. If anybody knows you know, I'm not going to let anything get me down. And uh, so uh, the minister said they were going to bring me up on campus. And Joe Sauter, who was the secretary of the Alumni Association, came over with all the Methodists. He said, let me care. He said, because we up the head of state because we were angry with them for what they had done. Because my understanding was, even until later, when you go to your room first, then you go register. They were going to clap gun in my things and would get me kicked out of school all back. And then this is what the ministers had prayed and, 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 and avoided. You see, so since I didn't have a weapon, now I now got food. And uh, so Joe Sauter carried me over there and got said, Well, you know, I'm not arguing about a room. I get over there, I got a whole wing of the dormitory by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only person that's living in a three story building, the keys to the outside doors. And uh, so we, I, I checked my luggage in and went downstairs. Dean uh, Gore and Dean Reagan met me. And uh, they were going to escort me to registration. And uh, the state, uh, Al Mingo met us rec room of the dormitory, it was Magnolia Hall there. And I understand they tore it down. Uh, so the, he wanted to know who was that. And uh, Reagan got a little mouth on the guy. He say, and who are you? And he said, I'm Colonel Lango. And they went on and said, they asked him what we're doing. They said, going to escort Mr. Frank to, to register. And Lango said, well, the court order didn't say anything about this. He didn't have to escort any other students to register, so you're not going to escort him. So I thought they were really trying to do something to him. Then I got on down, then the uh, Reagan and uh, Ford talked, showed me how to get to the library register. And uh, as I came down the walkway, uh, they stopped me and asked for my student ID. And, uh, and so it, 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 you know, you gotta, you gotta uh, get your anger a little bit. So I said, well, uh, I said, I don't have a student ID, I don't register for class yet. So he said, well, if you don't have an ID, you have to leave. I said, okay. Then another state trooper came and said, what's the problem? I said, look, you all know exactly who I am. I said, that's why you're here. So the other state trooper said, no, you have an idea. I said, you're going to drive like that. I said, go ahead and make the race. So I went up to the library and read and Larry Lingo came up there and put every, all the reports and everything out of the thing. And then uh, I went on the register to go back. So white students, of course, had to be white from all of them. in Tuskegee. Told me, you know, when I came over, I had friends, and two of them, Bob Betch and Jim Dinsmo, uh, uh, when, I, when I got to read, they came and shook my hand at the, at the library door, and the state troopers took them away. And then I got lost on the way back to the dormitory, and the head of security uh, showed me how to get back, and he said everything would be all right as soon as the state troopers didn't come in more problems than anything else, and I agreed 100 percent. But Fred had uh, argued my case for me, and, and, and did a beautiful job on it. But also, let me also point out to you, too, that what I try to do, I end up in, in, in higher education. And what I try to get my students to do, first of all, you want an extra 100 points? Go register to vote. That will automatically, anybody that ever had it will tell you that. Secondly, cast your vote. And I'll never get one of my students, uh, who's a physician now in Atlanta, Georgia, came back one day and uh, said that, uh, I was at Tom Lincoln College, and he said, uh, he overheard one of the registrars at the voting place said, one of them asked, why all these students? The students at Tyler College never came down to register to vote. And somebody said, Harold Franklin. And they came back and told me, I said, you tell them right. I said, you're going to use the extra 100 points we do. So what I tried to do with, with, with the help of people like this is, is uh, Fred, and, 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 and you Doug, and all the rest of them, is to try to make it a better place. Uh, try, try to get African Americans look. Get away from the guns, the games, the Drugs, use this idea to better yourself rather than go shoot somebody for two dollars. I'll get you some drugs and go out there and kill somebody. Over us. I, I, it just it bothers me, it really does. And uh, so I just hope that uh, some of the young people that here take advantage of it. Education, I don't care in what school you go to. And again, thank you very much. <laughs>
my Auburn experience was uh, different from the standpoint that, uh, along with Anthony, I was one of the, I was the first undergraduate 